This is Tommy's Outdoors 105, and our guest today is an ornithologist, naturalist, and author, Ian Carter. And we're going to talk about his latest book, Human Nature. The full title is Human Nature, a Naturalist Thoughts on Wildlife and Wild Places. Um, I think it's a very clever title. And um, I love the book. I'll be honest with you. I love the book. And um, there is a lot of thoughts in that book that I personally agree with. And I have a similar observations that, that Ian has. So uh, we had a great time chatting about the book and uh, kind of exploring certain topics that are in the book. And I just want to uh, give a shout out to those lovely folks at Pelagic Publishing. Pelagic Publishing specializes in this sort of books, uh, written by conservationists, uh, scientists, uh, naturalists, uh, people interested in the natural world. Um, and yeah, and just as usual, before I let you enjoy this episode of the podcast, if you want to support the podcast, the biggest thing you can do is share it with your friends and colleagues. Not only this episode, but in general, people who are interested in what we talk about here, human-wildlife interactions, nature, rewilding, hunting and fishing, conservation, this sort of things. Tommysoutdoors.com, Tommy's Outdoors podcast. Go ahead and share that with any and all people who might be interested. And, and just one more thing before I let you go. Now, if you want to personally reward me for all the hard work uh, that I'm putting in making this podcast, now you can buy me a coffee. Buymeacoffee.com slash Tommy's Outdoors. The link is in the description of the show. Now you can make sure that I have enough coffee to stay awake at night and edit those episodes for you. So that's it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Human Nature with Ian Carter. Ian Carter, how are you, sir? Welcome to Tommy's Outdoors. Hi there. Oh, yeah, I'm really good, thanks. Really good. Uh, good to see you and uh, good to talk to you. Um, listen, I was uh, you were on my list for people to talk to on the podcast for a while. I, I was following you on social media, but I was just looking for an angle. And we have a good angle now. You have a book com coming out, right? You, the book is already out. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's been a long time in the making, to be honest. Um, I, mean, I, I worked in conservation for as an ornithologist for 25 years or so for, for Natural England. Um, I, you know, and that was great. I did some great things, uh, offshore seabird surveys. Uh, I was involved with the Red Kite Reintroduction Project. Um, saw lots of sites all around the country through, through work. It was, you know, it was great. But towards the end, it was just becoming a bit frustrating. Natural England was going through budget cuts and staff cuts um so a lot of the staff were overstretched um and also lost a lot of its independence which was perhaps the biggest thing so i was working on projects and we just couldn't say what we wanted to say um you know it would be it would be influenced by the government department and yeah, it was really constraining really frustrating so yeah i decided to, to leave at that point and it, it's been quite cathartic putting some of my thoughts together on conservation, conservation issues for this book, when of course there was no need to go through the um, the government department to have things sort of checked. You know, I could just, you know, give my own views and my my own. So they so, so they would so they would uh, kind of sanitize your book if you're not saying stuff that I don't want you you know their peoples to say. Is that right? If I was working for Natural England still, and this book absolutely it would wow. be yeah yeah. Uh, so I do. I remember particularly one one of the final straws actually working on the Hen Harrier project, and I remember drafting something for the press release, and it said something like uh, about the the issues to do with uh, illegal persecution on grouse moors, and that that was the main threat facing this bird, which it is in England. And it went off to DEFRA's press office because we lost our press office. It was all done through the government. 
department and and mike that that line came back well hen harriers face a wide range of threats including climate and disease and changes to habitat and persecution so that was still in there (laughs) but they completely changed it and yeah that was the sort of thing that was becoming very frustrating right right it's probably it's probably subject for for another another podcast and higher and then more and all that yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah we could do a few hours on that one i think <laughs> i i think it will happen i think it will happen at some point no and correct me if i'm wrong that that book is really like a compilation of a number of various notes that you took over over time yeah ideas that are developed somewhere in my head over over many years recently so I'm, I'm particularly interested in i'm obviously interested in conservation but particularly some of the more sort of philosophical aspects how we interact with wildlife you know what it can do for us what we, what we can do for it for, for wildlife some of the conflicts some of the difficult issues that so hen harrier gets a a, a chapter in there uh, issues with non-native species and reintroduction so a lot of the difficult issues um and there's just short chapters on each one of those with kind of my personal take on it i guess yeah i i like actually I, i like the format very much because they were these like a short bite size uh, chapters that deal with with all these these uh various subjects and and i like the one thing that you said on the on them in in the beginning of the book i think that you initially it was like a handwritten notes right and you said like well and she's like ah if i took if I, if i make those notes on the computer i could search and whatever but then you turn out like no actually that was how you had like a better feel to have this analog yeah. kind of pen and paper notes yeah yeah absolutely so i keep a kind of what so it sounds grandiose wildlife diaries is, is but just a few scribbled notes and i've just done that I've, out of habit every day you know since i was sort of 15 or 16 oh, or so wow. and i still you know even now if there's just a few we've just had the swallows fledged from a nest in the oh, wow. in the garage and of course that goes into the dar you know how long they've been in the nest how long they'll keep coming back to it so just out of habit really and yeah it would make really good sense to have that digital because i could then search for it i could go back and think hang on what what was that experience i had with that particular bird I could go and find it now there's no chance because it's on 20 20 different books but still you know i wouldn't want to go back and i read something the other day about the uh wendell berry um an essayist from the the states apparently he still hand writes all his long length sort of books wow. he still hand writes them all so yeah there's still hope for the old the old style <laughs> and whatever 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 works for for anyone um i i think the time is coming where you will be able to take notes handwriting notes and then digitize them like technology is still not there yet quite but i, I think it's coming i think it's coming um listen so i think that the first thing when when i was uh reading or listening to your book the first thing that uh was very kind of like resonated with me is you said about how you know how difficult it is is more and more difficult to find places where you actually can experience nature on your own you have like this intimate contact with nature and you kind of um contrasted that with how people go to the nature reserves or the like a like a known spots and there's like a massive amount of people there and sort of that that resonated with me and and even before this podcast we had a we had a little chat and and I told you that nearby where I live there there is a small beach and a little bit of a shoreline with the kind of rugged uh, rocks and all that and I love that place I was going fishing there and you you meet every now and then dog walkers like a local people like these days there's like a damn car park over there like i stopped walking there i stopped walking there i stopped going fishing there because there's like so many people obviously there's probably the whole covid thing contributes to that but that was interesting thought it's almost better to be in a place which is maybe not as rich but you have the better connection i think that's exactly that absolutely sums it up because these days if you want the rich rich wild places rich in wildlife they do almost all tend to be nature reserves so you know if you think of minsmere in england and and titchwell 
all the sort of well-known nature reserves, that is where if you want to see wildlife in abundance and get really close views because the wildlife is, is used to people, those are the places to go and you'll have information boards. You'll be able to ask people there what's been around. You'll have hides, um, you know, so you can get closer photographers well, well catered for. But it is not, it's definitely not the same. It's, it's like, I mean, part of a, a, a fascination with wildlife, I think, is a bit, a bit of escapism, a bit of the world is, is dominated by people so heavily. Uh, sometimes getting away from that is you know is what i enjoy doing and if you go to a nature reserve you're going to struggle to do that because you're constrained by the pathways you're fed information there's people all around and even the wildlife is catered for it'll be at feet you know there'll be feeders set up and birds will be nesting in nest boxes so it all feels very <laughs> sort of human controlled and and dominated and that if you're looking for a bit of escapism a bit of a different experience just getting away from it so yeah, around here I live in sort of mid Devon between Exmoor and Dartmoor, and it is still possible to do that. You know, you can get to bits of woodland where there'll be nobody around, and you can get off the the path uh, into the middle of it. And it's not wilderness; it's not completely natural. But some of these woods have been left unmanaged for decades. They're called neglected. It shows what our attitude is towards these things. They're called neglected woodlands because they haven't been managed in any way for a few decades, but you can kind of set natural processes are playing out there and trees have fallen over and been left. Patches of scrub, you've got to sort of battle your way through boggy areas. There's no boardwalk to sort of help you out. You've, you know, you've got to find your own way through or round. So, and that just for me anyway, that really changes the experience and to, to get out and away from it all uh, in those kind of places is, is really important to me. Yeah, I even you know I can I can another example like like we, I personally and I know that many of my friends as well prefer to like when we go fishing, it's always better to go on you know Wednesday even if you have to take a day off work, you go on Wednesday you have less people on the lake you know you don't you don't have like go on a farm and like you said like uh, it's a farm and you have a cows but then you have you have a fox sneaking on somewhere you have a hare going yeah. here and there and yeah. even though you're technically on the farm you know if you're especially if you're if you're a hunter and if you're like sitting quietly and you kind of can suck in everything that goes around you you, you just see these animals doing about their job and, and mm -hmm. so on like that's and like you said it's just a pity that we don't have like a properly proper wilderness now i guess in in general in europe that's that's very very hard it's very hard to find right and, and like absolutely like, yeah like those neglected woodlands like you know again this is this is another the whole big topic about land abandonment and what is abandonment and what yeah. is rewilding and like you know because i i think people have very strong views on those things and and sometimes they're I don't know, not, not willing to see the other side. Right? Yeah, no, it's difficult. I think you're right. I mean, you can get away from people. What you can't do in this country and uh, most of Europe probably is get to completely natural habitats. So we, we went to Mull uh, off the west coast of Scotland uh, recently and I did make a big effort to get out into the middle of nowhere. I found the most remote bit of coastline I possibly could and walked, you know, half a day to, to get there. And it was great. You know, it was brilliant. I saw some really good wildlife. But the hills there have been affected by, you know, overgrazing uh, and the sort of excess of deer, excess of red deer. So even there, in the middle of nowhere, probably wasn't another person for two or three miles, but the habitat is still... So I think the, the big contrast there, I always think of, of the national parks in in the United States and Canada, where you really can then get out into, and it's pretty close to what it was, you know, before humans were, were interfering with it. And even all the top predators are still there and you have to watch around every corner just in case there's a grizzly bear there. And yeah. That and completely changes the experience. Absolutely. And it, it, you know, like this is, this is, uh, this is another thing that, that we might touch on the, on this right now uh, that you made in the book, like how fun it is that humans are not totally in control and i think i think that's that's super fun like i would love the 
you know, a couple of years ago, I was back in, in Poland and, and we, we went there watching bear. Uh, you just, just watch bears and, you know, coming, coming back home through the woods, knowing that these large oh. animals are there somewhere, like it adds to the experience so yeah. much. And, and, and you were giving like even an example, like a small example, like a, like a uh, fish, like a scor- scorpion fish or like a, this tiny fish in your book. But this is like, oh, it's a, you know, something else is there. Something else makes this place, calls this place home. Yeah, exactly. We, yeah, we yeah, lost. Exactly, we yeah. lost that. We lost that completely. We kind of we expect to be in charge, right? Yeah. But the best example I can give recently is we've got free range hens, and at the moment they're being picked off one by one. We've had we've we've penned them in now, but until recently, a fox was just coming in and getting one every every other day, just sort of reducing the the flock and. You know, it's not enjoyable. I mean, we, you know, my kids have given some of the hens sort of names, and you know, we don't want them sort of siphoned off by the fox. But that the fact that there's still things out there that can cause us problems. If we ever get to the stage where it is so sanitised that we've managed to find solutions for all these problems, and there's no wasps, and there's no horse flies, and there's no weaver fish when you go swimming, and there's A no weaver foxes fish. Taken. Yes, that was that was the fish. one. Yeah, from the book. Um, but yeah, I do think that's kind of just adds to the, you know, interest uh, it, and richness of, of life. I think the counter argument will be to that would be like, yeah, but your life doesn't depend on those hands, so you can enjoy them being picked out by fox. If that was your job and your income, then you probably would be there with a shotgun the following evening, right? Well, yeah, yeah, and people do, and I don't begrudge you know people that um, do take that kind of. I wouldn't go down that route but you know foxes are pretty common they're not threatened if the people did want to go down that route i'd have no problems problems with it but isn't it funny that it's the people in parts of the world that maybe do struggle and depend on livestock and you know are really on the breadline struggling to get enough food they're probably the ones mostly that have to cope with most of the uh, the wildlife whereas in you know uh, in places like britain where most of us anyway don't have to struggle anymore we've eliminated all the you know the problem problematic species yeah yeah that's a that's a that's a discussion i had as well you know when it when it's a discussion about wolves and and lynx reintroduction and all that like god damn it they're in the entire europe and like people carry on (laughs) and sometimes sometimes you know like uh, i don't remember uh, but the the words were I don't remember exactly the words. It was discussion about the reintroduction of wolves, I think. And, you know, I, I responded to one of the people said like, well, I don't know. We're talking about wolves, not about short faced bear, because, you know, it was like a picture, like almost like entire villages will be killed or something. Like, no, yeah. no, no. You know, it's, we villages won't stop existing if we have uh, wolves or, or stuff like that. So uh, I don't yeah. think there's ever been, I can't think there's been any, death as a result of wolves in europe in the last sort of few decades i might be wrong about that but i just it's almost it's unheard of or almost yeah. unheard of. Uh, very so, very very yeah. very seldom uh very very sel- it, it happens very seldom that's true um listen let's go back to the to the nature reserves um because uh you know the the, the point we we started talking about that really those nature reserves are awfully close to zoo Right, you have these birds in the bird boxes, and you have a trails, and you and you know, like zoo, have a big educational aspect, and mm. I totally appreciate that, right? Because you cannot, you cannot think about the next generation people to care about nature if they don't know about the existence of nature, right? So there's an educational aspect of it, but then from the perspective of like, yeah, we're protecting species, but we we not protecting the habitat, we're not protecting the processes. And everything, you know, they have a path and you have these things and then you can buy the ice creams over there and then you have a toilets over there and that's a nature reserve. Like, does it make sense? Does it, or is it becoming like a caricature of itself? I think there's a danger of that. I mean, at the moment, I think most nature reserves, although they've got the boardwalks and the, the you know, the, the hides and the visitor centers and the car parks, you know, most of the birds there are still at the moment completely freely wild and they come and go as they they please so you could say you know quite clearly these are 
wild birds and you can go to some of these reserves and see birds obviously behaving you know completely naturally um but yeah i do think that there's a a bit of a danger with the the feeders and the you know you can have so much artificial provision for some some wild species so that they're they're fed on what we've provided for them uh they're nesting in places that we've provided for them whether that's turn platforms or nest boxes and i think that does take a little bit of the edge off the sort of wildness um i can remember years ago i had about an hour to kill before i went for a meeting at rspb's headquarters at the lodge in Bedfordshire, and I had a walk around the woodlands and the heathland, and fantastic habitat. They've done a really amazing stuff with the habitat around, around the lodge there. But I didn't see any birds. I just hardly saw a single woodland bird. This is in, in winter. I thought, this is a bit odd. Um, anyway, I got back to the, the car park, and I suddenly realised what it was. There were so many feeders around the edge of the car park that all the woodland birds were there. It was full of siskins and greenfinches and red poles and all the common sort of woodland tits were all there in swarms sort of flocking around the, these feeders. And there was nothing in the woods because this was just easy. And it was probably half sort of tropical foods imported from elsewhere, peanuts and sunflowers and that sort of thing. And it was fantastic and people were loving it and watching the, you know, watching this behaviour, you could get really close to them. But that, to me... Uh, just pushed things a little bit too far. Where was the naturalness there? Where virtually the entire woodland birds was all on the, the feeders by the car park. It just felt a little bit too much, maybe. Yeah, yeah, right. I hear what you're saying. I, I, and, and again, this is something I was wondering. You know, uh, I, I, one person was wondering um, that the, the 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 nest failed. Uh, I think it was a swallows or, or something and the nest failed and it's like, oh, what, what do we do? We're going to do this nest and we're going to put the chicks back and we're like, right? Mm. And then it might be like, well, but you know, if these birds are were not good enough to make a nest that will hold up, yeah, are we really making favor in general to the species getting, you know, allowing these, you know, <laughs> unfit for survival birds to actually, you know, raise chicks and <laughs> yeah and i think the example i used in the, the book or the main one was was hedgehogs because that's a mammal and normally you can't get close to mammals to do anything you know without specialist techniques but hedgehogs you can walk right up to them and pick them up and there seems to be this vast industry now of sort of not only feeding feeding providing artificial food providing artificial shelter but going that one step further and if you've got an animal with with parasites on it it will be can be picked up and treated if you've got one that's underweight or not looking in good condition it'll be rescued and the people with garages full of hedgehogs that you know are kept alive through the winter and then re-released the following year and you do wonder is that starting to maybe even have an impact at on the sort of evolution of the species because all these underweight animals that probably wouldn't have made it are being sort of fed up and kept alive and then re-released and, and is it wildlife then when you you see them the following year because these are just animals that have come out of someone's um come out of someone's garage so yeah, yeah i do think <laughs> there's there's sort of issues where's there. the line where would you draw the line is, you know, because because there's this, like always these two things, right? If the species is in trouble, and and likely because of the human impacted landscape, then naturalists like yeah, let's let's make it life a little bit easier to them. But then there's this like so how how to how to draw a line? I think that when I mean, that's the the big problem is everybody's line is in a different place, and I just don't know how you get around that because for some people the idea of leaving a an underweight hedgehog to die is unthinkable, but, you know, they really feel a, an obligation to intervene. Personally, my line would be, well, you know, it's not nice to see, but I'm not going to intervene. I'm just going to leave it to see how things play out. And I think certainly with the, with the hedgehog example, ultimately the number of hedgehogs you have anywhere is set by the sort of ecological conditions in, in that area. So how much food, how much shelter, how much good habitat are the sort of predators around that could have an, an impact. But ultimately that will set your, you know, viable number of, of hedgehogs. And we're losing hedgehogs. So obviously the habitat is 
you know, is is declining. So however many, ultimately, however many you rear through the winter and then re-release, you won't change that sort of carrying capacity for the the local environment. So that's why I would try to justify this sort of non-intervention policy. But other people have a different view, and I just don't, I think that is almost impossible to resolve. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it's very hard at least. But you're right, then there is a the density of the species is artificially high in in the area and then that might in itself increase mortality so in the end of the day you're not doing any service overall no and you might be depriving i mean an underweight hedgehog might be a very easy meal for something like a badger which you know are capable of predating them if you take that easy one out of its way maybe it's the badger was going to go and kill a Something else it'll have to. But that's do. a good it'll point. So that's a good. That's a good. That's a good point. They they would they will have to turn to something, and since they don't have those weak ones, then like well, <laughs> so you you end up decimating the strong ones from the environment, and then releasing yeah. all the wimps <laughs> after the yeah, winter. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So so yeah, and that's all, of course that goes unseen. So your underweight one that's rescued, the the people involved get a get pleasure and satisfaction out of doing that. And then when the badger takes a different one, that's in the middle of the night when nobody sees that. So, yeah, yeah. So on that, so on that, on that note, um, this is very, very old, really question or debate. And and you touched on this on in your book about, you know, reintroduced or maybe even tagged animals. How 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 wild they really are. And mm-hmm. you, you know, it was it's. You you came from the slightly different angle because you came from the angle of, you know, we put those animals and they never got there on their own devices and you know how wild they are and we give them good head start and so is it like next year, next generation, ten generations when they're when they're really wild, um, and where where I was where I had a, like a similar thoughts, I heard many discussions, for example when people are tagging animals, tagging deer or tagging mountain lions, that there is, again, this debate that this is, quote unquote, messing their brain, that they're really not wild. I even I even um, heard opinions that the hunter who sees the animal with a collar, they know we don't want to take it because it's not a wild animal. And they're and you know some scientists say like no it's it's a load of rubbish you know this is just wild animal we just color it and so on and the other scientists saying like no 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 if you see the difference how the that animal behaves one once it's recaptured second time and a third time it's definitely less wild it's 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 already knows what's going on i'm gonna be you know they're gonna jump on me they're gonna do something and they're gonna release me so they're like when it was less wild right and even for me when i see the birds and they have like this you know five or six rings on the on the, on the you know or, or some uh, tags on the wing or i even saw like some you know like a saddle on the on the on the beak in the case of dogs it's like I, I know that this is science and we this is for good of the species but like i'm not comfortable with that man yeah uh- yeah, I, I I agree. I used to have this argument when I was involved with the red kite reintroduction. All the released birds were tagged, and they had a lot of them had radio transmitters as well. And because it was a you know a, a project, a scientific project, or you know we needed to gather that information on those birds. So I think it definitely serves a purpose at times. You know, you need information on if if you're doing a novel reintroduction, are the birds going to survive? Who's going to pair up with who? What, what movements are they going to make? Can you find them if they die so you can establish the cause of, of death? So where there's a particular reason uh, and you're getting that kind of valuable information, I do think there's a place for it. But I used to have arguments with bird watchers and photographers who just hated the wing tags and thought these birds are just plastic, artificial, obviously messed around with by humans. And the older I'm getting, the more I... I see that. And I I must admit, I don't like the fact that so many, um, so many of our sort of uh, most enigmatic species, if you like, now do almost all of them. I imagine most of the golden eagles now in, uh, in Scotland will, will have rings on, not, not, not the wing tags. Uh, And quite a few of them have got transmitters. Um, 
It's difficult. I mean, I think where there's a where there's a need for it, where you're getting really good, useful information, there's a place for it. But just a lot of almost ringing birds and marking them for the sake of it. Um, but the hen harrier, that's a good example where there was some really brilliant information. Um, so many hen harriers in England have been fitted with tags and transmitters over the last few years. And it's shown very clearly, you know, that they are uh, much more likely to die when they wander onto intensive grouse moors. And of course, that information, the, the only way you're ever going to get that, because these are remote sort of places out of the way and people are covering up the crimes, is, is to do that kind of tagging. So, yeah, I think there's a place for it. But, yeah, philosophically, I think it just diminishes a bird a little bit when you see a, a colouring or a bit of plastic, you know, hanging off it. And probably it inconveniences the bird. You know, you, you keep that to an absolute minimum. But as soon as you add anything to a wild bird, and there's also the process of capture and, and handling it and the stress involved with that, it is going to affect them, even if it's just a sort of tiny little bit. Right. That has to be taken into account. So you're firmly, firmly in a camp of it's messing their brains. Messing their brain. But I think, you know, for the sake of conservation, where there's a really good uh, purpose behind it and a really well organized study and you need that information and there's no other way. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. But I wouldn't, you can think of a, a, a just do a, do a thought experiment. But, you know, if it were possible magically to capture every wild bird and put a ring or a tag on every single one of them, Think of all the brilliant information you'd get from that. But I think that would just be absolutely disastrous. I would, I would hate to think that could happen. But, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Maybe with the uh, technology, the tags will be smaller and work longer and whatever. I don't know. But that's that's a that's a that's a that's a good conversation. That's a good consideration. You touch on the on the hen harriers, and I don't want want to spend like any any like a massively large amount of time on this. But you mentioned that that they're 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 disappearing of over those moors. Like, um, just for my knowledge, what's the argument against? Like, yeah, but this is where they would mostly be anyway. So that's why the most of them are 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 missing there. Is that a valid well, I think argument? The, no, I mean it makes uh, yeah intu intuitively it, it might make sense, but this is where this tagging study was really really useful because it what it did was it looked at all the movements of the birds, you know, a big sample size as a whole, so you could see where the birds were going and you could calculate like a a probability of death per day spent in a variety of different habitats, and that very clearly showed that yes, or they are spending a lot of time on intensive grouse moors, but they also spend a lot of time on other habitats and they are far more likely to be gotcha. killed. So it's like a per of unit time. of time. So it's like probability exactly. per unit of time. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. 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 Yeah. That's, that's good. It's good to know. Well, man, we talk about all these things and it's like, it's, there's no escape that we, we talk about how we negatively impacting nature. Right. And the title of the book is human nature. So <laughs> I even like that kind of uh, there's a little bit of play of the words there in the title, right? We we did um and are about that title for a long time and uh, people have I hope some people are attracted to it because it kind of catches their attention and think, hang on, what's it human comma nature? What does this mean? And it's sort of supposed to work on a few levels, but yeah, some people have said well, some people, one or two people, in fact there's a very bad review on on Amazon of the book because someone has obviously bought it thinking it's about you know human nature rather than oh not like a human end <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it has its it has its issues but haven't they seen the, it's the, the, the um, cover like they should see a look at the cover like does it not give you yeah. hints about what the well, book is all about <laughs> I think that's why the sub, you know, the, the extension of the title is so try to be sort of crystal clear, just in yeah. case there's any doubt. So yeah. Yeah, that's 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 funny. But yeah, if you're if you go like to, to mass places like Amazon, you will get all sorts of you know strange <laughs> <laughs> strange people and strange opinions. Um listen, so we, we said a lot of time about a lot of things about how we're impacting nature and, all, and the birds and everything else. Other thing that I, I'd like to ask you about and talks to you about is the impact of noise and light pollution. You know, I, and, and I, and I, you know, maybe that sounds stupid, but I always think about 
impact of noise and light pollution for myself. <laughs> I you know like every time every time my neighbor installs a, a new light on their yard that that goes on through the entire night. Like man, oh. like why you why are you doing this? Yeah. You know when I when I moved in where I live here, it was like completely dark at night, and I loved it. And then the one dude set up a yard the the lamp on his on his garage. And then another one. And it's like, what the hell is going on? Are they a long way away from you or they're quite close? Well, the one was a long away, but the but the, that light was like extra strong. And then like, a, you know, my neighbor next door actually, but he also put the plastic grass on his yard. So that's... that's, that's <laughs> I don't Sacri- even... Sacrilege. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, don't even, I don't even want to comment on, on this podcast. On... <laughs> so obviously follow up with the lights is a natural progression for him. Um, but how, how does... How in, in your, like, what, tell us, how does this affecting wildlife? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I completely agree with you. It affects humans, I think, first and, and foremost, in that you just, it's very, very hard to get away from artificial light and artificial noise. And occasionally when you do, and I sometimes make a special effort, and it's probably easier around here than it is in a lot of places, but when you do finally get to a place where there's no artificial sound, and it's just completely quiet. There's something really magical about that. And we don't miss it maybe because most of us probably just have forgotten what it's like. It's almost a bit of a surreal experience when you, you're standing somewhere out in the middle of nowhere and think, I can't hear any road noise or planes or, or anything. So first and foremost, I think we're impacting on our own well-being. But yeah, it definitely, I mean, on those increasing numbers of studies, both for light and for for noise that shows it it does affect wild animals um, to a varying degree. I mean, but you think of birds having to sort of sing, change their song patterns, sing different types of song to get above the traffic. Um, think of seabirds and the, the when they when the young fledge, they use the fact that the sea surface is normally the brightest thing they can see, brighter than the land, to use that to sort of decide which direction to head off in. And if there's a town nearby or a village with artificial lighting, they can sometimes go completely the wrong way and end up in land and puffins do it, Manx waters, some petrels. Um, I think turtles have a a similar effect. I think, is it maybe the young, when they're on the beach, they hatch out of the eggs, they should be heading for the sea. But if there's lights behind them in the dunes, they go the wrong way. Wow. So yeah, it can have, it can have big effect. And, Bats is another species that they really, you know, they lose habitat when it's too bright because they're fearful of predation. So it reduces the habitat they can they can use. But it's just one of these things. It's another, yet another human impact that is works well for species that are flexible and adaptable and can cope with it. But the more sensitive and the the more specialist species. Uh, lose out so it's one of these things where we're we're selecting for the species that can cope with our activities and adapt and a lot of them can um but others i mean some benefit as well thinking of um some waders i think can feed for longer and better overnight if there's artificial lighting peregrines notoriously will hunt um things that are migrating across um the towns and cities uh, they're using artificial lights on sort of cathedrals and uh, urban buildings to hunt. So for some species, it's uh, yeah, they, they're getting something out of it. But overall, I think we're selecting again for species that can cope with our activities, and uh, you know that's not a good thing overall. I don't think. And and we going back to the question, you know, then how wild they really are, right? After after a number of generations of animals, like yeah, right, we we hunt at night because there's all these lights and mm. whatever you know, ins- like it impacts uh, how insects be- insects behave as well. Um, I bet. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing. So so if if you're impacting on this such a low level, then you're impacting everything because then whatever feeds on birds will take that opportunity, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one, right? So that's. Yeah. I, I just don't think there's many species out there. I think in, a, in birds is my sort of main interest, but there's not many birds now that don't use humans in some way. I mean, the, the swallows and the house martins and the swifts are nesting in buildings, the peregrines on 
um, buildings using the artificial light. So many species depend on or benefit from the feeders. Uh, I mean, I put food out as well, so I'm guilty as anybody, but all the woodland birds, again, coming out of the woodland, taking artificial food. And that, that also has or is likely to have knock-on effects in that the species that take most of that food are doing really, really well out of it. Things like blue tits and great tits have increased. Uh, pro probably uh, the artificial feeding is a factor there. But other species that take it less often are probably now being outcompeted by those sort of um, the species that have done well. So we're losing things like marsh tits and, and willow tits. And maybe they're being a bit outcompeted by great tits and blue tits that are, are thriving on this artificial food. So, yeah, we are. You're right. We're losing a lot of the, the wildness um, out there. Should it be should it be like a research done and like you know I'm half laughing because there is like so many needs for research and no funds for that at all but you know almost like we we should have a research and it's like okay what food can you actually put and how much system right you're you're allowed you know three kilos of uh, per winter <laughs> no more because then then that would affect right that would be one solution I guess yeah that'd be interesting to know what the trouble is would people stick to it that would be the, the difficult oh thing yeah when, uh, you know but, so yeah. whether the it's, it's purely theoretical I don't I'm not expecting anyone fund any sort of like <laughs> the research like that but that would be at least in theory a solution to see like okay how much you can add into into that i think there is uh, just on that i think there is some research already that you know in terms of feeding having impacts on certain species certain species benefiting from it there's certainly been surveys that have tried to quantify the amounts of food provided and I've, i can't quote the figures but it's a vast amount and it's a multi-million dollar or multi-million pound sort of industry in terms of selling the bird food and stuff. And there's also research on disease because these sites where birds gather are more likely to pass diseases on. And we've seen huge declines in green finches, probably or well, chaffinch is another one that might be where disease might be an issue. And they're probably picking these diseases up and, and transmitting them close to feeders. So it is a, I think it will be looked at in more detail in the coming years. But. That's a good news. That's actually good news. Yeah. Is there other other thing that I think about, you know, I, I read the other day how food that we eat impacts how our bodies work and how our brain work. And, you know, it was like when, you know, the, a cow or a hoofed animal normally, you know, eats this and this and this, and this is the impact it has on its meat and its hormones and everything else. And then when we eat this, this is what's happening. But when you eat a cow that eats like one thing or maybe it's grain, this and this is not happening and then this how it impacts our brain our liver once we eat this meat which by the way i i'm not intending to upset any farmers who are listening to that but my you know uneducated uh takeaway was like the food that we eat is absolutely shit and just we, it's very hard to do anything else because of these changes but surely this impacts those birds the same way but you mentioned they getting like a uh you know not natural food like peanuts and other stuff so that must that must impact their bodies and their hormonal balance and everything as well same way yeah you do wonder don't you because obviously a you know a british great tit would never come into contact with a peanut naturally it would just have no <laughs> chance and yet they are kept alive by these things in vast <laughs> sacks over the winter so yeah it, is that having a i mean who who knows but it must be having sun you know you're right it's not what they would be used to naturally so yeah. <laughs> another idea for, another idea for a research it, more research yeah. yeah in case any scientists listen to that and i'm sure they are there are quite a few um that's another idea of the research um listen i don't want to get you in trouble but you already said it in your book very honest very honest description about owning a pet and i did Pets are, you know, they're, they're pets. They're doing stuff. And even if you really careful, bad things will happen, right? I, I even I even had a, a tweeted last time about the cats that, you know, having cat at home is just it's, it's just it's just a massive wealth animal welfare disaster because that cat is not meant to be kept in the home in, in a house. Never mind, you know, if someone has an apartment in a multi story building, but Curious about your opinion, because you were, you know, had such a down to earth and honest 
description of of pet ownership i see this trend that you know almost i feel like you know i don't know if five or ten years from now pets will be banned you can't you can't have cats you can't have birds you can't sorry you can't have dogs you know and some of this is very well there's there, there's there, there's a good reasons for that right let's say the your 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 dog if there is a breeding season and birds are you know uh, sitting on the nest sitting on the eggs but your birds probably your dog probably shouldn't just sprint in the middle of a of a terran colony or something but then on the other hand you know like there are birds and they're you know there's outside of breeding season and the dog you know just runs and those birds starts flying away you know, probably nothing that tragic is happening to those birds. You know, if we had foxes and wolves and lynx, probably similar things would happen. And those animals would have a vastly greater chances of catching any one of those birds. Because let's be honest, like uh, your average dog has, has precisely zero chance of catching any one of them. So then maybe it's not, uh, it's only like an opportunity for, you know, recreational outrage on social media. You know, what are your views on on this? You know, how much those, you know, how how much pets really impact wildlife? And I know there is a lot of impact, but then on the other hand, there are other benefits, mm. and maybe it's a little think, bit, it's a little bit exaggerated. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. I it varies place to place, but I think the effects are very real, simply because of the density of of both people and the. Uh, animals so it has been made very very difficult for things um trying to think of example say ringed plovers trying to breed on on beaches you know they nest on the shingle and the, the sand at the top of beaches and they're simply unable to do that i would say now across the vast majority of you know the the, the most densely populated coastline of, around around england there's very few places now where they can rear young because the nests are sort of trampled they're disturbed constantly by by people and their and their dogs so and yeah there's i think there's other issues with disturbance with wintering water birds where they're maybe at the edge in terms of keeping themselves alive um they've got to eat for a vast you know high proportion of the day sometimes night time if food's in short supply and the weather conditions are really cold they it's a very fine balance and if people are constantly putting the whole flock and you know what they like when you see a sort of flock of geese and ducks they don't just sort of shuffle along a little bit, 20 metres, they are up in the air, circling around, burning a lot of energy. So I do think the effects um, are there, well, quite what you can do about it. I and mean, it is about education, I suppose, having restrictions in the places where you really need them, trying to have areas of beach sort of roped off, trying to have nature reserves with information about keeping your dogs under control. The one thing I think that would really solve it, and, and this is the problem we sort of run up against all the time, is that the good wildlife habitats are now so small and fragmented that these kind of problems are enough to sort of tip the balance in a lot of cases. If we had bigger areas, it, as you say, it would it would have far fewer impacts. It would be less of a problem. So maybe in the future, if we can get some of these big sort of rewilding projects off the ground and you know big areas set aside for wildlife the dogs are then less of a problem but it's right, tricky right. I can't it's nice 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 pivot Ian, into rewilding now <laughs> <laughs> we had to get there at some point didn't we <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um are you are you more in favor of maybe not in favor uh but how do you what you think is if you if you had to pick one if you have to pick the fortress conservation model that is you know fence and gate and there's a wildlife and outside of the fence and gate is us humans in our supermarkets versus kind of blended model but you have these all these impacts that we said so yeah we have a better you know we live together with nature but at the same time you have your light, you have your pollution, you have your not pure. So is that you have like a the, this diluted wildness. Which one would you pick? Or or maybe better questions like which one do you think is the future? 
So which one out of what comparing nature reserves? As yes, a, as compare, comparing comparing this this fortress conservation. You know, like let's have this you know massive amount or big amount of land. Okay, fenced. Yeah. That's I'm, the wildlife gonna, over there. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna duck the question. I'm afraid, okay. I and mean, I do I do think you need both. Really, I mean, I think there are some areas where. You know, you've got such small amounts of habitat left. If you think of um, lowland heathland or chalk grassland, flower-rich chalk grassland, heaving with invertebrates and, you know, rare butterflies and those habitats, uh, you just would not want to lose those. And I think in place, you know, where you've got those surviving now, you will need, uh, it's pretty normally small areas, but you need constant intervention to, to maintain them. Otherwise, they'll you know they'll convert to scrub and 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 woodland, and you would you would lose those high quality habitats. So I think you need that, and there'll always be a, a need for that. But if on top of that, being greedy, you could have some of these big projects where you set aside you know bigger areas and just give whatever your definition of rewilding. I mean, mine sort of is it's to do with giving natural processes more of a, a role. You might not leave it completely to nature. In some cases, you might if you've got the opportunity. But it allows bigger areas uh, more of a role for natural processes. And hopefully you then get that mix of habitats through those natural processes. If you've got sort of grazing animals or surrogates for the, the wild species we would have had, then... As has been shown in some projects already, sort of NEP is the, the classic one in, in Sussex where they've put in sort of these uh, old breed pigs, um, ponies, cattle, and you've got a mixture of woodland and old uh, ancient trees, scrub, bits of grassland and open areas. Uh, and they just, you know, leave it to see how that develops. It's dynamic. You're not going to protect one little patch of grassland that might become scrub in a few years, but hopefully the cattle will open up a another area so i think there's a real place for that i hope we do have there, there's more and more projects starting up and i think that is the way forward but definitely not by binning your traditional approaches to uh, to conservation yeah yeah no i it, it definitely uh, definitely feels like a tide is turning and there's a more and more of these things uh showing up here and there and this is another point that you just made uh, that you, that you're also talk about uh, when it comes to those nature reserves that they they sort of like a frozen in time. This is like there's no vegetation succession. We have this type of vegetation, and then we you know maintain this, and this is like a wildlife reserve. Like no, 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 no. It's like it's, nothing like that happens in the nature. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. But when you've got such small areas of high quality habitat, it's like, it'd be unthinkable to lose them. And I, I can think of some bits of chalk grassland. Um, actually near where my, my parents live, full of orchids and huge diversity of, I don't know, 30 or 40 different species of plant per square metre. And it is, it's, it's, it's semi-natural. It's created by grazing over the centuries, but it's taken so long to get to that stage. It supports so many rare species. And it's such a tiny area now. To, to, to lose that by not intervening, I think would be, yeah, almost un, unthinkable. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, listen, so one other thing that you're, I, I like the quote in your book. This it's not a quote. This is a quote that you're you're quoted in your book. That's that saying is that the uh, staying at home breeds insanity. Uh, <laughs> I absolutely loved it, especially like a lot of people now when they had to stay at home for obvious reasons. <laughs> it was like, oh man, and and we touch on the education and how people should care about it, and like what 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 do you think what we could do to make sure that future generations, our kids, will value nature like because like what we talk about here you know it's it's i don't i think it's like a domain of old people like nature and you know silence and you don't have do you, this is very depressing isn't it? yeah i mean <laughs> I, I mean you, you know and and this is this is happening in in many you know like like if you look at the hunting and fishing there's like so little people getting into 
these uh, and you know like i understand that many who listen to this podcast they are not very fond of hunting for example but at the same time this is gives that understanding of nature this contact with nature this understanding of like there's a winter and there's a summer and the animals behave differently and this is where they breed and this is where like what's happening and then these elements of you know pure toughness when you're just sitting in the woods and freezing your you know off um how how yeah what's your comments on that how how we how we can this is this this very very one 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 last thing this is an example that you brought in your book and i i read that in in some other book uh earlier on as well that for example the the in a in a kid's school book some words were replaced like mm. bear with replaced with broadband and stuff like that yeah, exactly yeah like yeah. how how to even start preventing because we can talk about reserves and rewilding all we want you know when the next generation comes in it's like what the heck is that let's get rid of that right yeah that's very very difficult the trouble is there's so many competing interests very difficult to battle against because you've got so many you know you can link into through your smartphone and through the tv to all the stuff that's going on globally and for kids especially that's a great temptation so how you when i was growing up you know there weren't those alternatives and you know i was almost kind of kicked out of the house and told to amuse myself for the afternoon <laughs> and you'd go off to the woods and um you know you you'd, you'd connect with sort of wildlife that way um i don't know with my children i tried to uh, as i think as a, a a chapter in the book about it i tried to kind of almost insist that they weren't allowed out on their own because now we worry about sort of safety and there's so many roads and traffic issues but we did do a lot of family um sort of jaunts out into the countryside and very often it would be a struggle you know they really wouldn't be their top pick of activity they'd want to the computer games would be more appealing or the, the tv would be more appealing um but the uh, thing I noticed is if I kind of insisted and we had half a day out in the woods exploring the countryside, they would get something from that and they would be happier and more communicative, I think, after a day doing that than if they had just stayed inside looking at the, you know, playing a computer game. So in, in one sense, while you've, you know, when they're young enough that you can kind of control, have some control over it kind of you know push that little bit and try and get them out there uh, and there's so many there's so much research now um i read a book by uh, is it lucy jones i think losing eden which is all about the scientific research behind why nature is good for us uh, some of the classic old studies about if you've got a hospital window that looks out over trees and greenery you need less medication and you're actually more likely to survive. You know, it's quite dramatic. That's an old study, but they're starting to sort of look now and find chemicals in the air and in the soil that are out there. So when you go for a walk in the woods and you, these chemicals get into your, into your system, that is having a sort of measurable effect on, on your health. It, it's good for the immune system some research that suggests it, it, it's preventative in terms of some some disease so in terms of your physical and sort of mental health it, real real benefits and if that if those studies become maybe better publicized more well known um maybe that'll be a little bit of a push to for families to sort of get out there and spend more time um yeah out in out in the natural world yeah and ultimately that will also hopefully translate for 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 those young people value more nature. I was uh, I had a podcast number of well years at this stage when I was when I was talking with a with a um, my guest Philip and he was Philip Stallard is his name and he is a social worker and he works with kids with kids with problems. But this is exactly what he does. He takes takes them you know build a build a build a campfire build a shelter, cut the tree, cut the branches, you know, go fishing, go surfing. And, you know, everybody knows who, who were in nature that once you're in nature, you kind of like slow down and you kind of calm down and just like, how the hell I could ever survive in this like nonstop, you know, race. And this is, this is like, 
I said it many times, probably too many times also on a podcast. Only when I, I, you know, I was born and raised in the city. And only when I moved to countryside, I realized how damaging to human psyche the city is. It's like, it's, a, it's cool. Especially if you're young and you have a, you know, look for opportunities and you, you know, want to get a little bit of money and you want to do this and that. But long term, it's like, man, it's yeah. just damaging. Yeah. It, is, it is worrying. And uh, I actually interviewed my family for something I'm sort of working on at, at, at the moment. I, I talked to my parents and also my children about their experience of this. And it's just frightening. I think they're fairly typical of just how things have changed in a few decades. So I talked to my dad. He was brought up in rural Gloucestershire. And the countryside, it was connected to it. You know, he would actually use it. He would go out with, with his mates from school and they would, they would raid moorhen nests and duck nests for eggs that they would actually eat. And they would trap rabbits for, for you know, for the table. They would collect wood from the, uh, the forest. They knew the names of plants that were, were edible. So there was a real, like, eight, my dad used to rear sort of pigs and he'd collect acorns from the woods and, you know, so that a real solid connection. When I was growing up, I still had access. I was allowed out to roam around, but there wasn't that kind of direct interaction. Um, I wasn't sort of utilising the countryside. It was just a place to play, um, but you're still getting out there. And now with my kids, as I said, it, they, they're they not allowed. They weren't allowed out to sort of free roam because of the safety concerns. So it was very much as a family and I think they lose a lot of that chance to sort of explore on their own, independent learning, you know, finding things out for themselves. That's gone. That's all that's happened in what 40 or 50 years, a few decades. So that rate of change is, is really frightening. Do you think that those safety concerns are real or is it or is it that just something changed? Like, is it our, you know, acceptance of risk changed rather than actual risk? It's probably a bit of both, isn't it? I think the concerns about sort of strangers and, and paedophiles and that sort of thing probably, you know, I don't don't think that there's any more need to be worried now than than in the past. But certainly, traffic densities make a lot of places genuinely for small children anyway. Before they've learned to negotiate the road safely, you yeah, you you do you would run risks there. So it's probably a bit of both, I think. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. Like in the in the cities, in the towns, that's 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 for sure. That's that's for sure. Um, listen, uh, just just to wrap this up, uh, one last thing I want to talk to you, which was quite intriguing. Um, what's that? What's the deal with this gamification of bird watching? Because like the whole book is really hinges on bird watching. You're this is like a main main contact with nature, which is which is understandable because birds are probably the most accessible form of wildlife that we have. Um, and, you know, what's fascinating about these, these little games, you guys, I'm saying, bird watchers play with a, you know, list of garden birds and like when it counts, what is, like, do you see it in the garden or whether I don't see it in the garden yeah. I say, oh, I see these birds, so I, walk, so I run to the garden to see the birds. I put it on the yeah. list. Like, I didn't know. It's quite, it's quite sad when you write about it. It doesn't feel so sad when you hear someone else talking about it. It suddenly <laughs> feels quite, quite sad, but yeah, you're right. It is just, I suppose that's what it's. I, I think it probably comes from the hunting instinct. This it's kind of lists, isn't it? Garden lists or year lists and it's collecting and I guess that stems from the hunting. So rather than going out and actually hunting things, you're collecting them. I mean, uh, photographers would say, you know, instead of going out and sort of shooting things, they're, kind of, they're shooting things with the, the camera. I guess it's that. I guess it's a bit of fun. I think it probably has benefits. So this year, I don't do it every year. This year I'm doing a, a sort of year list and trying to see 200 birds in a year, which is harder than you'd think it would be. But I've noticed things that I probably wouldn't have otherwise noticed. So around here, I should have seen garden warbler and lesser whitethroat by now. And there's places where they breed around here or have done in previous years. And I haven't seen them this year. Now, if I wasn't making my sort of sad little year list and totting up the species, I pro that maybe would have got unnoticed. But I have, I have noticed that. The other thing about complete lists is it is a good way of um, gathering information. And if you then submit, so if you keep a, even if you just go out for an afternoon, if you keep a complete list of every bird 
type of bird species that you see and then send that through to the BTO's bird track, um, which I'm very bad at doing, actually. But, yeah, I've, um, it's a way of avoiding biases if, if you just send in selective records then the danger is as a species gets rarer you're more likely to note it down and submit the record so it kind of skews the data but if you keep a complete list of everything you see and send that in that's a sort of more standardized way and the information is more useful so it can play a useful role in terms of um gathering information just to try and justify a bit of the, the sadness there <laughs> <laughs> no i you know i must admit I'm a, i'm a big sucker for these sort of things and i think that this gamification uh, it kind of, it's a good it's a good way uh, actually to you know get get the uh, younger generation get the kids into this because you have this like you said this 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 thing this competitive especially competitive people this yeah. competitive element right as long as you no, just don't no no cheating <laughs> No, no cheating. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's the same with everything, though. Presumably, with sort of hunting, if you if you if you, you get a new species that you've never hunted before, presumably that's quite a big a big thing. And you know, so I guess it's partly kind of just human human cover nature, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Trophy birding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, listen. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic conversation. Listen. Uh, any final words? Any conclusions? Any final words of wisdom for for our listeners? Words of wisdom. Um, crikey, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because we're all so we're very conscious. We're all so different in the way we interact with wildlife i suppose one thing if, if you've never done it before um so if you tend to sort of keep to the footpath or keep to the known sort of routes why what about trying just just once sort of um picking a local site maybe a woodland and try to get as far away from other people and the footpath where you constrain I and mean, footpaths are great a to b bit of exercise but if you really want to explore and get a feel for a place you can't do it if you're constrained on one line you need to so even if maybe you don't have permission or um don't know the, the landowner just once try and get into the middle of a wood as far away from any signs of human activity as possible have a little poke around maybe a flask of coffee or something and you know the benefit in terms of one simple thing you can do that you know could have a a beneficial effect on your sort of state of mind and, and well-being uh, it's really hard to beat so maybe give that a go yeah that's that's fantastic advice and when when you were when you were saying that i remember that that i watched a video where uh where a guy decided to sit for 20 minutes on the beach like a simple thing that just just sit for 20 minutes on the beach and it was fantastic exercise because he said like in the beginning first you know seven minutes there was anxiety and it was like you know how how many minutes left like and as he started sitting like he started to kind of calming down coming down the the thoughts stopped to be like you know or tangled and he said like by the end of those 20 minutes he was actually disappointed it's already up <laughs> Because he yeah. was he was ready to to, to sit twenty more. So yeah. this is like what you're saying, like go in there and just go in the woods and just sit on the log or whatever and just try sitting for twenty minutes. Yeah, or even just don't have a plan. You can sort of wander and just find out, you know, where you end up. Don't it, or foot with the way footpaths are set up. You're you're always going from somewhere to somewhere else, probably to a time scale. But if you just don't have a time scale, don't even know where you're going to end up and just have a bit of a wander around and uh, very good for the state of state and, and of leave, mind, and leave your phone switch off as well another good uh, absolutely, <laughs> right absolutely, like just, just yeah. leave the damn yeah. thing <laughs> yeah leave it at home yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh ian uh thank you for your time i appreciate it uh the book uh human nature um what's it what's the subtitle then? Uh, i've got a yeah, naturalist thoughts on wildlife and Uh, and wild places there so, you go naturalist yeah. thoughts on wildlife and wild places human nature excellent book very good read very pleasant read um so recommend even if people are not ah, these days probably most of people are listening to audio version as well yeah uh, um, you know it, it's, it goes great with both versions so 
uh any bookshops right amazon and anywhere else available yeah i think so yeah yeah the usual the usual places depending on your ethical um yeah the standpoint. what's the, what's the yeah. best way what's the where, where is what is the best way to buy it to support you well, it's the, the publisher is pelagic publishing and you can get it through their through their website so that's There probably a go. good a good starting point Pelagic Publishing. I'm going to put a link in the show notes so people listening or watching this, they, you can go to the show notes. There's going to be a link to the book to Pelagic Publishing. Uh, Ian, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. 